Five years ago today, on July 3rd, 2012, a Scientologist was found dead. Whatever ideas come to your mind when I say the word Scientologist, I want you to clear them out of the way, because those aren't significant in deciding how to think about the death of this young man. He was not some nameless, faceless religious zealot. He was not some low IQ idiot who deserved what he got because he was stupid enough to join a destructive cult. In fact, objectively speaking, none of these extremist labels apply to him. Just the opposite. He never was asked whether or not he wanted to be a Scientologist. At the time of his death, he was a former Sea Org member, he was a son, he was a husband, and he was my friend. His name was Alexander Gench, and this is his tragic story. People come into this world and leave it every single day. Some of them are remembered, but most are forgotten in the mists of time. This life and death was special. It was special to those who were lucky enough to know him, and as we're going to talk about in this video, it was special to so many more people who never got a chance to meet him. I am making this video because I don't want Alex to ever be forgotten. This is my memorial to him. It is a tragedy in three acts. Alex was born on November 26, 1984, the son of Karen and Heber Gench. At the time, Heber was the president of the Church of Scientology International, and Karen was his assistant. They were both members of the Sea Organization, a cloistered paramilitary group which makes up the core of the Church of Scientology handling all the church's management functions, as well as delivering Scientology's confidential upper-level services, otherwise known as the OT levels. As the president, Heber was mainly responsible for Scientology's international public relations and acted as the official church spokesman. The C organization consists of the most fanatical Scientologists, people who dedicate themselves to a billion years of service to Scientology because they believe it is literally the most important thing in the universe. Because of this, Sea Org members who had children back in the 1970s and 80s would turn their children over to Sea Org nurseries to raise them, agreeing to only seeing their kids maybe an hour a day and often hardly even that. The people put in charge of these nurseries were not trained or experienced in child care or education, and often these kids were left in unsanitary, disgusting conditions with little money spared from Scientology's millions to provide clothing, food, toys, or even a safe space for the children to grow up. Once this became known to the public at large, as these children grew up and escaped from the confines of a cult they never wanted to be part of, the Sea Org changed its rules so members who became pregnant were coerced to terminate their pregnancy. They were treated as second-class citizens for daring to think about having a family. Physical and emotional abuse, segregation, and peer pressure were brought to bear to convince the pregnant mothers to have abortions. And if that didn't work, they were kicked to the curb with $500 severance pay and an assignment of what's called a lower condition, which means that they were not in very good standing with the church and had to spend weeks or even months doing amends for their betrayal. This, too, eventually became common knowledge as former Sea Org members came to realize that this kind of psychological and physical torment was not normal or acceptable in a civilized society, and they spoke out about what had happened to them. Only very recently has this finally brought about a change of conditions within the church, so pregnant Sea Org members are turned out without attempts made to forcefully persuade them to terminate their pregnancies. The only reason the Church of Scientology changed the way it treated its members was not because anyone in the church realized that this was gross and abusive, but because it was creating ill repute for the church publicly. The attitudes and prejudices have not changed one bit, and the executives in charge of Scientology still believe their abusive behavior was and is fully justified. 
As the son of the president of the Church of Scientology, Alex was treated better than most other Sea Org children and had opportunities to be part of public PR functions and meet Scientology celebrities and VIPs, such as Chick Corea, Bob Duggan, and John Travolta. When Heber Gentsch was arrested in Spain in 1988, along with 69 other Scientologists, it became an international incident, protested by the Church of Scientology through any means they could think of to try to get Heber out of jail, including using Alex on television to garner sympathy for Heber. Keep in mind that Heber hardly ever even saw his son. After three weeks of incarceration, Heber was granted bail of a million dollars and fled the country immediately, never to return. It wasn't until 2002 that the charges were finally dropped and the bond money returned, but by then Heber Gentsch had much bigger problems. In 1988, Heber and Karen divorced. This had been arranged and pushed for months by David Miscavige personally behind the scenes, something Karen was not aware of until after it had all gone down. As church spokesman, Heber traveled often, and Karen had been separated from Heber and was interrogated for months in what is called sex checking, in an effort to get her to confess crimes against Heber and her marriage, which Miscavige could use to convince Heber she was no good for him. Karen had no such crimes, but the external pressure on them both from the head of the church was too great for their relationship to survive. Alex was four years old when this happened, and in 1990, Karen left the Sea Org with Alex in her custody. She remained a Scientologist in good standing and worked hard to maintain that. When Alex was 11 or 12 years old, he was recruited to join the Sea Organization. It being the group his father was still part of, and hardly ever getting a chance to see him, Alex joined with the hope that he could communicate more often with Heber. Instead, Alex was shipped to Scientology's largest church facility in Clearwater, Florida, called the Flag Service Organization, where he did estates work, mainly cleaning. His parents remained in California. Here, Karen describes Alex's relationship with Heber and the general attitude of the Sea Organization towards children an attitude which still exists today. Alexander Gentsch was only permitted to see his father 11 times in 15 years. He used to call himself the boy without a dad. And he used to glum on to older males and kind of adopt them as sort of pseudo-dads. Stan Gerson, this, this guy, for example, was one of those. Alexander had a chip on his shoulder that Heber would never see him. But I don't think Alexander got the full picture. Al Heber was never allowed to be a dad. Heber was not allowed to parent Alexander. There's no bloodline. There's no knock off all this family crap. That is Scientology. That is the cult of Scientology. So to deny a father any rights to be a parent. That's par for the course of the cult. As a 12-year-old boy with little formal education and under the care of random adults at FLAG, Alex had no real exposure to the outside world or the dangers of sexual predators. And unfortunately, despite their ridiculous claims of being the most ethical group on the planet, over the years the Church of Scientology has had more than its fair share of adult members who have sexually abused minors. Alex was one such victim. Here's how Karen related this to me. Alexander Gentsch was having sexual intercourse at 12 years old at the Flagline base. I only ever knew that after I came out. Matt Pesh, bless his heart, wrote to me. He was the first one. And then Tom DeVocht and Kersey and Eileen and that's probably one of the reasons they wanted to keep Alexander well away from me. The reason he got out of the flag land base was he'd had sex, and what they do is get them out of jurisdiction of the police. 
many people speculated that one of the reasons they kept him away from Heba was the fact of this sex. And you know the girl, the 40-year-old who was having intercourse with Alexander, is currently an OSA operative. Alex remained in the Sea Org and never spoke about this incident to his mother or anyone else. The one and only priority of the Office of Special Affairs is to ensure that word of such incidents as this never make it out to the public. The way this is done is to separate the offenders and make it clear to them that they are the ones to blame for what happened. There are many policies and writings from L. Ron Hubbard which are used to convince Scientologists that no matter what happens to them, they are always personally responsible for their condition. In Scientology terminology, Alex was responsible for this because he had pulled it in, meaning he had committed his own moral transgressions, which had enabled these circumstances to occur, and it was therefore his fault he was sexually assaulted as a minor. OSA staff have no regard whatsoever for the laws of the land or for civil or due process unless those laws can be used to the church's advantage. In this case, they were faced with a PR nightmare. If it came out that one of their own members had raped a minor, there would be no end to the public bad repute, so they chose to cover it up. The view of OSA and the Church of Scientology as a whole is that whatever is good for the church is far more important than what may be good for its individual members. Never mind that harboring someone who would rape a child can hardly be considered something that is good for the church. But in the twisted logic of the OSA staff running such things, so long as the Church of Scientology's good name is kept untarnished, they are fulfilling their duties. With Alex under the church's control and in Los Angeles under close watch on a Sea Org base, they felt they had effectively dealt with this incident. You can only imagine what kind of damage this must have had on a young Alex Gench and how this impacted him for the rest of his life. Alex was assigned to work in the same organization I did at the time, the Continental Liaison Office, or CLO, West U.S. This was the management body for Scientology in the Western United States, and had many other functions, including estates work for the entire Big Blue facility, running the numerous Scientology events, which occur seven times each year, etc. To the best of my recollection, by the late 1990s, Alex wound up running the boiler room, which contacted local Scientologists by phone and email to get them confirmed to come to these events, and he did this for years. As part of this function, during periods when this call-in was not happening, Alex was often utilized to go around to Churches of Scientology in the West U.S. to rally people in those places for local fundraising events. He was good at his job and did this for years. He met another Sea Org member named Andrea Kavan, who worked at the Scientology Celebrity Center, and they married. It appeared that Alex had found some degree of happiness within the confined and restrictive world of the Sea Org. However, there was another problem. His mother, now known as Karen Della Carriere, was working close by and was running an art dealership. And through the mid to late 2000s, as word got out from former high-level Scientologists of the abuses that were occurring at Scientology's highest levels, Karen was becoming more and more disaffected with the Church of Scientology. David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology and the leading officer of the Sea Org, was keeping senior church officials and executives locked up in a double-wide trailer at the International Scientology headquarters in San Jacinto, California. These trailers had iron bars over the windows and a guard at the door and was known as the Hole. The unfortunate Sea Org members stuck in the hole were being victim blamed just as hard as Alex had been years before, being told over and over that it was their fault and they deserved every bad thing that happened to them, including beatings, sleep and food deprivation, enforced group confessions, and for anyone who dared to want to leave the Sea Org, 
heavy manual labor for months on end in the hot desert sun in a place ironically called Happy Valley. Heber Gensch was one of the people incarcerated in the hole, and word started getting out in news media about this. Karen talks here about how Alex contacted her about this. I was refusing to go back in when they were calling me for services. I was distancing myself. And Alexander knew he would go on tour, he would be off the base, and people were coming up to him saying, David Miscavige beats his staff. And S.B. Hole was, <laughs> people were reading the Tampa Bay Times, it was called St. Pete Times, The Truth Rundown. So Alexander was calling me from places like Seattle and Portland saying, Mom, Mom, they're saying David Miscavige beats his staff. And I responded with things like, yes, I've read the truth run down. I think I said something like that. So Alexander and I knew a lot more than Office of Special Affairs had figured out at the time. While the situation with Karen's disaffection was brewing, Alex had another situation. His wife got pregnant. In fact, his wife got pregnant twice. As I mentioned earlier, the Sea Org's policy about dealing with SO members who become pregnant changed over the years, and these two pregnancies occurred right in the middle of that change, in the mid to late 2000s. Karen describes what happened with Alex and Andrea. Everybody who leaves the church has to go on video camera and sign half an inch to an inch thick uh, paperwork that they'll never talk to the media and never go to law enforcement and never tell anybody outside the church what goes on internally, what goes on in the RPF, the beatings and the sadism and the craziness. And Alexander and his wife, two years before he left, she got pregnant the abortion was enforced. But right around that time, there was internet outrage at enforced abortions. And two lawsuits were winding their way through the courts. So when Alexander Gentsch's wife got pregnant again, they were not enforcing abortions. She no longer had to stand and clean gallery, go to the galley to clean dishes 10 hours a day. First time she was pregnant, she had to stand on her feet and wash dishes 10 hours a day as punishment for getting pregnant. Second time, Alexander and her were given an okay to leave. I'm not gonna have you around with babies, get out of here. But before Alexander could get out of there, he had to be sec-checked, confessional auditing, which starts off with, I'm not auditing you, and all that means is they can use anything you say for punishment. This went on for four months. As I've talked about elsewhere, when I first found out as a former Sea Org member what was really going on at the highest levels of Scientology with the whole and David Miscavige's abuses, this opened my eyes to a great many other things I'd witnessed or experienced over the years, which hadn't really made a lot of sense, but which I justified because of my fervent belief in the inherent goodness of Scientology and the Church as a whole. In the late 2000s, Karen was experiencing this herself and began posting anonymously online about Scientology, the Sea Org, and her own experiences about it. I was posting under the anonymous name of War and Peace, but I gave out too much about myself. And they connected the dots. I mean, how many people were on the ship with Hubbard, trained by Hubbard? I mean, they're just, 
It just, I gave out too much. So they made this hate page, um, de declaring to the world, War and Peace is Karen de la Carriere, which was such a stupid move. Because people don't go come confiding in you when you have an anonymous name. Once you're out, the day I came out on Marty's blog, I had 500 email in one evening. With Alex and Andrea determined to keep their baby this time, they were following the usual routine of leaving the Sea Org, and Alex was initially planning on moving in with his mother. At first, Sea Org security was okay with this, until Osa found out about it. When he exited the Sea Org, he brought his luggage to one of my guest rooms, and he and his wife were going to move, live here for a while. I had planned on giving him a job. I ran a gallery of artwork. But suddenly, after leaving all his luggage, there was silence for two, three days. And do you know what the Sea Org did? Do you know what OSA did? They not only got him an apartment in northern Glendale, they furnished it. They bought him a king-size bed. They bought him a refrigerator. Sea Org money paid for Alexander's personal furnishings. They so much wanted him to not live with me. So they made it their business to turn him against me. With Alex set up in an apartment furnished by Osa, they then went in harder on him to get him out from under any potential influence of his mother. As the son of Heber Gench, Alex could cause irreparable PR damage if he were to speak out about what had happened to him when he was 12, something Karen still knew nothing about at this point, as well as what he had seen and experienced during his years in the Sea Org. It was a top priority for Osa that Alex either deal with his mother's disaffection or that he disconnect from her entirely. So they took Alexander to this page which took out my confessional data and mocked me. So Alexander said, Mom, Mom, I want you to see this website. Now, he was in a room which had all kinds of voices, like a phone bank room. And you would hear all this and other voices. And it was a complete and utter sound interference room with multiple voices. I'm guessing he was at Osa Int. And he said, um, I want you to see this. And I realized Alexander had been turned. His voice sounded excited and, str you know, your own son's voice. He sounded strained. He sounded uptight. He sounded like he was being dictated to and, and, and so on. And I said, look, Alexander, if you want to play Osa's game, we're done. It's so sad because this is the last time we ever spoke. Not having convinced Karen to change her ways, Osa decided that the only way for them to keep Alex away from her was to arrange for him to leave the state. Karen had not yet been declared a suppressive person, meaning the church had not officially labeled her as persona non grata, but they definitely got the message across to Alex that he was not to talk to her, lest he himself be declared a suppressive and booted out of the church. I think that the first year he was out, I was still in good standing. This good standing means you're good. You don't post on the web. You don't talk to anyone declared as back channels. So I believe in the first few months, he, basically, how did he get there? Rick Melrose offered him a job and even some partnership in the business and stuff. And I think Osa highly approved it, wanting him away from me, oh, separation. So he and his wife relocated to Dallas. Yeah. I think during his relocation there, I came out on Marty's blog. And then, of course, that was that was the end of that was the end of him being able to talk to me. Why would Alex go along with not communicating with his mother? 
because at the time such a thing meant he would himself be declared suppressive. The Church of Scientology was the only thing Alex knew, having been involved with it since the day he was born. It would mean he'd probably lose his wife and her whole family since they were all deeply involved with the church. And if Alex were declared, he would never see his father again. Yet what was his relationship with his father at this point? Karen relates here an incident that occurred before Alex moved to Texas when they got together and explains a bit more about Heber's own tragic past. If, if Heber was allowed to see his son, it would be for two hours. That counted as a time together, two hours. And they went and had a burger near Officer Special Affairs, the Hollywood Guarantee Building. And the two hours was up and Heber had to report back to Osa to go up lines. And Alexander by now knew about SB Hole, which actually opened in 2005. And I believe this was 2009 now. And Alexander said to Heba, Dad, don't go back. Don't go back. You don't have to go back. Alexander was thinking of him going back to SB Hole and being more and more abused by Miscavige. And Heba said, he sort of hung his head and said, Son, I, I have to go back. He Alexander didn't have the fire and brimstone in him to do a sales job to get someone out of the Sea Org. This is a guy born in the cult, raised in the cult, would report his own mother. In a, he, he, you know, he once told me, Mom, I, I know they do a lot of bad things, but there's also a good side. He had tremendous conflict on good and evil together. He, he was said, son, I, I have to go back. I've done a lot of bad things. I, this little anecdote he told Jim Jackson, just so you know, how did I find out? Alexander didn't tell me. <laughs> but, um, you know, Heba came from a polygamist family, very highly abused by his father. His father used these 42 children as a workforce, as a kind of sea oak. They had to plow in the, plow the fields and have production quarters. And he would shock them with electric, electric uh, cattle prod. So one has to be very forgiving of Heber. I know how he's acted up sometimes on TV and stuff, but he came from a cult, a cult. And he was susceptible to the next cult. Karen was officially declared a suppressive person in 2010, and Alex could now have no contact with her under any circumstances. And here, Karen relates the last time that Alex flew back to L.A. to see his dad. Alexander got a call that Heba could spend half a day with him. <gasps> and this was, whew, the most would be two hours or a little morning breakfast slot. And Alexander went overboard. He bought a $2,000 suit. It must have been Armani or something. And he bought, uh, he got, he bought an airfare from Dallas, Fort Worth. And he came to spend this Half day, he was told, with Heba. He couldn't see me. He wasn't allowed. I was the suppressive person mom, so all he had really was a dad. He had no, there were no siblings. He's had step half this and that, but not, nothing from, his, from Heba's bloodline. And he um, came to L.A. He reported to Osa. And something happened up lines. He was forbidden to leave. It was canceled that Heber was 
Did you see the control? He could not leave to see his own son. And Alexander was told, sorry, he can't come. And he was crushed. He got back, he went straight back to LAX, got on a plane, returned to Dallas, Fort Worth. And three months later, he was dead. He never, ever got to see his father again. A lot of Alexander's friends that I didn't even know about contacted me after his death. And I was very comforted to know that he um, was very conflicted in the OSA manipulation against me. I thought he'd bought their lines, hook, line, and sinker, that I was evil, that I was attacking the church and all that. He was texting a girl in Chicago who, ooh, they would text and text. And they, would, they just grew up, I think they grew up in the cadet org and the ranch. They were just friends, just friends, nothing more than that. But they would text every day, every day. And she told me, Karen, he was so conflicted. He told his handler, Donatella at OSA Intelligence, he said, I don't agree. I don't agree that I absolutely can't talk to my mom. He, he, bucked the, he buckled against the manipulation that he absolutely had to be done with me. I didn't know that. I thought they had poisoned him 100%. But he was fighting it, and he resented that he was in a position because he had no dad. His dad was an S.B. Hole. His dad was a prisoner of David Miscavige. And I was made out to be this devil with horns, this evil, evil Hitlerish person who attacked the Church of Scientology. So he was orphaned, basically, without a mom and dad. And when he really needed a mom and dad, with high pneumonia, he could never talk to Heber, and he had no mom. After moving to Texas and settling in, Alex and Andrea lost their unborn child in a tragic, natural, spontaneous miscarriage. Soon it became clear that Alex's sheltered and cloistered life had ill-prepared him or Andrea for living in the real world. Karen gives the bullet points here. Oh, their marriage went on the rocks. It was hardly, it was hardly, she was partying out. She still lives in Dallas partying, to my knowledge. She was partying out late at night. She wouldn't come home. She had girlfriends and she became a party girl, enjoying her liberties after the cloistered sea org she was in. And so Alexander really didn't have a wife. and. He got fired from his job. Marriages amongst young people in the Sea Org often don't last very long. And more often than not, I've seen Sea Org couples divorce after they leave the ESO and hit the harsh realities of life in the real world. There's too much stress, too much angst built up, and emotionally these couples aren't prepared to deal with it. They become overwhelmed and their relationship blows apart. Alex's big partnership job turned out to be a farce also. At some point, Alex got into a car accident in Dallas and was put on Oxycontin, a heavy-duty painkiller for back pain. It appears from the limited information we have that he had substance abuse issues, and at the time of his death, methadone was in his system, which is often used to treat Oxycontin withdrawals. Gabapentin was also found in his system, which is a medication prescribed for seizure disorders and nerve pain. With his new life in tatters, separated from his wife and without work, on June 29, 2012, Alex drove from Texas to Los Angeles to start a new job. He arrived at his in-laws home since he was still forbidden to talk to his mother. He developed a head cold on the trip back and took over-the-counter medications. This developed into pneumonia, something neither Alex 
nor his in-laws recognized for what it was. Alex was having trouble breathing and was running 103 fever. How does Scientology deal with that? Here's what happened. And, it, and he was hanging out with an OT8 called Stan Gerson, a magician. And Stan gave him a touch assist for his inability to breathe. No hospital. You know, if Stan Gerson had taken him to a hospital, they would have immediately diagnosed the, the pneumonia. To the best of my knowledge, he had a high fever and he went to bed. And the whole of the next day, he, he didn't, he, they thought he was just sleeping in. But they didn't really do checks. And the following morning, he was unresponsive. And the in-laws carefully made all their calls to OSA. Then the CCHR head honcho took Alexander, took his kid to school. No call to 911. Two, three hours have gone by since they found him un unresponsive. Then they call 911. And because of his age, when you die at that age, it's always the coroner and autopsy. I contacted Edward Winter at the LA coroner's office about this case. Here's what he had to say. I was the assistant chief. I still am assistant chief of investigations. I oversee all the death investigations in LA County uh, and uh, especially the high profile celebrities uh, uh, and politicians or whatever. On July 3rd, uh, we were advised uh, a, of a death at a private residence in Selmar in the 13,700 block of Oro Grande Street. Uh, according to the law enforcement who reported it, is that uh, the decedent was last known to be alive by his in-laws when they left the residence for the day. When they returned later, they uh, appeared to be in bed sleeping. Uh, that was on the 2nd, and on July 3rd, about 7.30, the decedent was found unresponsive in his bed by his father-in-law uh, during a welfare check. Uh, the decedent, or the father-in-law, did not call for paramedics, however, took his uh, son to school and then returned home uh, and called paramedics. They responded and pronounced him deceased. The decedent was uh, Alexander uh, Jens. We sent an investigator, responded, and he was uh, transported back to our office. Uh, there was an at-scene investigation and an autopsy performed. And that's what uh, our initial uh, investigation was about. Well, uh, number one, uh, when you have a 27-year-old male that uh, passes away and uh, it's reported that uh, he had some sort of a accident and was over-medicating due to a traffic accident, uh, we wanted to find out uh, some additional information and possibly medical history. And uh, he was driven out from Texas to California. And according to the father-in-law, he complained of a, having a head cold, which he took over-the-counter medication. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're taking over-the-counter over medication, along with back pain medication, uh, there can be a reaction. However, we weren't able to, uh, you know, connect the dots, so to speak. And uh, 
supposedly, when the paramedics were there, medication was uncounted for, unaccounted for. So we did have questions. It also was strange that uh, his father-in-law would drive, would instead of calling paramedics when somebody's in distress or unresponsive, why they'd leave, drive a, drive the kid to school, a child to school, and then return, you know, sometime later. Uh, le- you know, found him at seven thirty and came back at eight twenty-three. Uh, that's a long time. So there, there was a. There was some questions, and then his mother contacted us, contacted me, and was providing information, additional information, on his uh, uh, his personal uh, medical issues and other issues. We're able to uh, do an investigation. Uh, we found that after the autopsy, uh, he had acquired pneumonia and was using methadone and took some additional uh, drugs. A couple things, his his wife and him are separated. His wife uh, is not there at the house and he's staying with his father-in-law. Then as this investigation proceeded, uh, we reached out to the Church of Scientology and got no response. Uh, tried to talk to the wife, and when we'd call the house, the father-in-law would say she's not there, she's unavailable, and she wouldn't talk to us. Mm. Uh, and then uh, we were con- I was contacted by an attorney for the church that uh, wanted... Uh, wanted to have uh, information removed uh, from the report. You know, sometimes we get that, but we had this attorney that called, complained that the mother is making allegations and posting on the internet that Jeff did not call paramedics right away, and she requested a sentence be changed in the report as it is not accurate. Uh, And uh, we told her, hey, the report stands as is. I know that during the initial part of the investigation, we attempted to have uh, Riverside County Sheriff's make contact with his father uh, to see uh, to notify him, and the sheriffs called us. They went out to Gold Base and uh, were not granted entry, and we're told that they would notify uh, Mr. Jens about his son's death. Uh, we ruled it as a, a possible accident, uh, and that he had uh, pneumonia and had taken some over-the-counter meds, and possibly his and his meds. But I can't be specific on which meds he took. Ed sent me the toxicology report after we spoke, and it clearly states that Alex had a mixture of medications in his system at the time of his death. At the scene as well. Officers recovered meloxicam, which is used to treat arthritis and inflammation, gabapentin, hydrocodon acetaminophen, which is a painkiller that can cause respiratory distress when combined with other substances, methadone, Prilosec for acid reflux, which is something Alex suffered from, sufedrin for a stuffy nose, and Vix NyQuil. In researching this, I spoke with Ed and other medical professionals and each confirmed that had Alex simply gone to an emergency room for his high fever and other symptoms, he would almost certainly have been diagnosed immediately with pneumonia and treated properly with antibiotics, the one thing he was not taking to deal with his illness. There was no reason Alex had to die. It was simply ignorance combined with the pseudoscientific garbage of Scientologists thinking their useless touch assists are more effective than medical science, which killed this young man. Now, to make this whole thing even worse was the cold-blooded and completely heartless actions taken by the Church of Scientology following Alex's death. The church knew exactly where and how to contact Karen, and you would think 
that if there was even an ounce of compassion in the heart of anyone there, they would reach out to her to let her know her only son had died. But that's not what happened. So, I first heard about Alexander's death, unbelievably, from a Facebook message from a stranger. Aaron Smith Levin, who, who now is a friend, but at that time he was a complete stranger. And he said that Alexander had died and that he had verified it with uh, the wife. And I just immediately called Mike Rinder. It was, I thought, it's got to be a mistake. It must be Heber. Heber <laughs> he was up there. And Alexander's name is Alexander Heber Gench. So I thought, because at 27, you don't wake up dead. And, uh, and, and Mike Rinder said, I am so, so sorry, Karen. It's true. And I immediately called Tony Ortega. You know, Tony Ortega gave me more comfort and support than the entire cult that I had served and given tons of money to for 40 years. They were brutal. They let his dead body lie in a morgue on a slab between other dead bodies with a toe tag. They didn't have the decency to let me know this connection even in death. Karen was not alone in this. Her husband, Jeffrey Augustine, decided that despite the church's heartless attempts to keep this news from Karen, at least they could pay their last respects to him at the funeral home. Here's what happened. What happens when somebody dies? Legally, their spouse, if they're married, has custody of their body and is allowed to dispose of the remains. Because Alexander Jensch was married uh, to Andrea Caban, that's her maiden name, Andrea had custody of the body. I called down and we couldn't get custody of the body. So we sent our friend over to Alexander's in-laws, Jeffrey and Maureen Evans, who are OTs, to ask if we could have custody of the body. Karen wanted her son. And uh, they told our friend to get off the property, they'd call the police. They had already hired a criminal defense attorney. Why? Because in Los Angeles, as all other municipalities, deaths are treated as a potential homicide. That's just one of the things. There's only five causes of death. And initially, because Alexander died under suspicious circumstances, it was treated as a potential homicide. So Alexander's in-laws and his widow were already lawyered up. Look, it's not a good thing in the Church of Scientology to, get a, to find Heber Gentius' son dead in your home. And uh, Jeffrey Evans obviously freaked out. So the OSA machinery, Office of Special Affairs, went into full gear. Karen, Alexander's mother, can't have the body. Okay, so all she wants to do is see her dead son's body and kiss him goodbye. That's it. We're told no. No, you can't see the body. Now stop for a minute. This is where disconnection, fair game, goes beyond death. You would think just out of the humanitarian gesture that Andrea Kavan and her parents, her stepfather and mother, would say, yes, Karen, you can visit your son and see his dead body and kiss him goodbye. No, no. This is, this is when you're up close and personal to disconnection and fair game. When you're seeing Scientology in its brutal form, that's what it looks like. It's sadism. And this is one of those days where the earth stands still. Everyone has those days in their life. This is one of those, this is really happening. They're not going to let my wife see her dead son's body. You know, my initial thought <clears throat> was those sons of bitches, they really belong in prison. This is just cruelty for the sake of cruelty. But then you realize 
And it's not cruelty, it's Scientology. And, and people make fun of Scientology. You know, they make light of Xenu and the volcanoes and all that. Okay, and I understand that. But when you really see the system of cruelty that Scientology is, and you're, you're in it and it's a hot day and it's real life, and a mother can't see her dead son, then you know what Scientology really is in, in real life. Not their dishonest, deceptive PR. Their slick commercials. That's what disconnection is, and it, dis it continues after death. We have people in the Office of Special Affairs, OTs, trashing Karen online, trashing Alexander online. This is really vile to get these sick phone calls. I got a phone call from an old Guardian's office person. I won't use their name, but they said Alexander really was unhappy with his mother, didn't like her. They were calling to tell me this. Someone from the Guardian's office. And that pretty much, that they would try to stick a knife in me hoping I would tell Karen. That tells you what the Guardian's office is doing. Even after they leave, that damage is there. People were shocked. The, the emails we got, I'm so sorry this happened. Now these are Scientologists who were not afraid to communicate, to email, to call Karen, to tell her, look, I don't care if I'm still under the radar or in the church. I'm sorry you lost your son. I'm really sorry your son died at 27. It's a tragedy. No mother should ever have to bury her son. And the humanity you saw is still, that we saw, it's still there in the church. The people who were involved, Jeffrey Maureen Evans, Andre Kavan, they were under enormous pressure. It's only been with the passing of time that I can understand the pressure they must have been under, the, the threat they must have faced, coming right from David Miscavige's office, because he was micromanaging this affair. The story of Alex's death reached the media, but not because of any overt action on Karen's part. She had not yet started her YouTube channel, Surviving Scientology, or been speaking out in any broad public forum. But this was around the same time that Katie Holmes had walked out on Tom Cruise and their marriage, and Scientology was a hot topic item in the media. So the story of the son of the president of the church dying under unusual and suspicious circumstances was too good to pass up. Despite this, the church was not going to hold a memorial service for Alex. Here's what Karen and Jeff did and how this all turned out. I found out that Alexander's death was completely buried in pack. None, no one knew at CLO. No one knew anywhere. So Jeffrey and I made plans to have a memorial. There was no memorial. There's never been an issue that nothing came out. And we rented a boat, a little yacht. And we decided to, we didn't have the ashes um, or anything. So we decided to throw rose petals. And this whole thing sort of fled up into a kind of media event. Inside Edition was following with cameras. And so at the last moment, the church decided to put a little memorial for him together at Celebrity Center. And Heba did come down for that, looking absolutely haggard and old. And you would think that Heber would do the ceremony. He did the ceremony for tons of deaths. But I, think, I don't think he was capable of, um, you know, even doing the ceremony. I believe Stan Gerson did it. A little crowd came from Celebrity Center in the, you know, the garden in, in CC. But that was just done for damage control because I was making a huge... You see, they weren't going to tell me. They were hoping months after all of this, I'd find out if at all. If it wasn't for Aaron Smith Levin, I would not have known. So we had a wonderful ceremony. Alexander didn't have any... He didn't have... Uh, you know, the Sea Org feel they are elite. 
this hallucination and delusion, this is a almost a criminal band of people that snitch on each other, that beat each other, that do awful things to each other, that are domineering, are invalidating, that live in a culture of hatred within, but they consider themselves the cat's meow. Alexander did not. He had a lot of walk friends and walk, I hate that word, non-Scientology friends. So we invited everyone and his dog. We didn't care if they were SP or critics or whatever. <laughs> we had invited everyone. There were about 150, 160 people that showed up on the yacht. And we had exquisite catering. And, we, you know, we had a memorial ceremony and then we released a huge bunch of, bunch of balloons to symbolize his spirit going out in the air and through all these rose petals. Karen and I don't want another Scientology young person to die because of disconnection. And yet the policy goes on. And you read on Tony Ortega's blog about the, the deaths in Narconon and what goes on. And here's, I'll be as blunt as I can, the Church of Scientology is a culture of death. Well, I have mellowed out a lot. I like to think that even though I feel it's my duty to expose the cult for educational purposes, I don't feel the retaliation and the buzz that I felt that I did in my early videos. I was there to I did have an axe to grind at that time, no longer. I think that it was making my own world toxic. And I had to let go of a lot of that. Does it mean that I don't reveal more about the church and have boundaries and parameters? Does it mean I the church can just walk all over me and fair game? And absolutely not, you know. But I don't have to have vengeance within my soul anymore. So when I talk about the church, it comes from a point of, I did it. I brought this child into a cult. I, 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 I did it. I married him and I had a baby in the cult. So... Everything that happened was after what I have to point the finger at myself. And when you have a child in the cult, you can lose your child to death at the age of 27. And there's no one to blame but self. I no longer, it is true that he died because of disconnection, because of Hubbard's policies. That is true. Because if he wasn't manipulated against me, I have money. He would have had the best med if he'd come back with all his pain and all that. I would have had a full top-of-the-line diagnosis. He would have had... Ed Winter told me, Karen, 99% of walking pneumonia cure on, on antibiotics. His autopsy showed not one antibiotic, none. Only drugs. But he couldn't see me because of their toxic policy of disconnection. And for a long time I felt the cult had blood on their hands because they didn't stab him to death, but they <laughs> disconnected him, manipulated him. He couldn't see me. He got pneumonia and he died. I come from a different vantage point now. I will not die hating the cult of Scientology or feeling vengeful anymore. Do I feel the need to educate and expose? Yes. But that A, 
edge I had is gone. I don't have an axe to grind. In the short time we have in this world, we live and laugh and love and cry and do the best we can to make something of ourselves. All of us have had our ups and our downs, and hopefully, when we look back on where we've been and what we've done, we can be content or even happy with what we've accomplished. But not all of us are born equal. Our circumstances, our genetics, our family's economic and social position, and countless other factors can stack the deck against us before we even get started. Alex Gensch faced a life of just such challenges. He didn't ask to be born into a cult. It was not his choice at all. And near the end, he'd finally gained enough life experience and wits to question whether Scientology was really everything it claimed. In that way, he was actually quite smart. It took me almost 10 years longer than him before my eyes started to open. Alex was a friend of mine when we were both in the Sea Org. We were not close up and personal friends, but few in the Sea Org actually can afford to be. We had plenty of common interests to chat about and enjoyed talking about books and movies and geeky things. I never had cause to think anything negative about him. Alex always brought positivity, pride, and even joy to his work. And believe me, that was not always easy to do given the pressures we were under. In looking back at the circumstances of Alex's life, there really is no other word to describe it but a tragedy. I have missed him and will continue to do so. I truly hope that he is in a better place now, but who can really know? What I can say for sure is that we should remember Alex for so many reasons and never forget that it is Scientology which cut his life short. There was so much potential lost in his useless and stupid death. But if in learning about his life, we can somehow prevent the same thing from happening to anyone else ever again, then his death will not have been in vain. Alex should always be remembered as one of the good guys. Regardless of whether there's some spiritual existence or not beyond this one, if we keep the memory of Alex alive, then he will never really be gone. Thank you for watching.